The scripture reading is from the Gospel of Mark, uh, Mark 11, verses 12 to 14 and 20 to 25. Hear what God's Spirit is saying to you. Jesus curses the fig tree. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Here ends the reading of words that give us light on God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Friends, will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, may we be confident that your kingdom is within us and around us. And may we be a part of its creation and not stand in its way. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be pleasing to you and acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, it's time for more weird stuff in the Bible. And today we've got a question that lies before us. Why does Jesus hate figs? Or I guess more accurately, he likes figs, but he's mad at the fig tree. Why does Jesus hate this particular fig tree for not giving him figs? It wasn't even the season for figs. What is up with this scripture? I'm assuming that this scripture might be a little bit more familiar than some of the other ones we've talked about in this series, but maybe not because it never appears in the Revised Common Lectionary, that collection of readings that most churches follow. But even if it is familiar, I think it's still a, a confusing passage that very often gets misinterpreted. So here we've got Jesus, he's hungry, he looks off into the distance and he sees a fig tree. He goes up to it. There are no figs. He gets mad and he says, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. Then they leave and they come back later and Peter says, oh yeah, Rabbi, I heard you say that. And look, it's come true. The tree has withered away. There's nothing left. It's down to its roots. And Jesus says, you think that was impressive? Listen to this. If you have faith, you can move mountains into the sea. Oh, I like that. That's much nicer, isn't it? That's what we usually take away from this scripture lesson. I can see it now. I'm picturing the poster with the beautiful mountain range. I'm picking out the font. Have faith that can move mountains. I'm going to hang that on my wall. But is that really what the scripture is talking about? Is that really what this is about? What is going on in today's scripture lesson? Cursing the fig tree. I'm not going to think into uh, the fig Newton question. Sorry. So what is the scripture lesson about? 
Well, first, I think I'll, I'll give you a couple of common Christian interpretations, and then I'll tell you why I think those traditional interpretations are wrong. The first goes something like this. Jesus performed this cursing of the fig tree as a sign. It was a sign of his power and his divinity. And so he cursed the fig tree, it withered and died so that people would know who he was and how powerful he was. He did it because he could. That's one traditional interpretation. But to me, that sounds a bit like when my daughter asks me if she can do something, and I say, no, you can't. And she says, why? And I said, because I'm your dad, and I said so. <laughs> it's circular reasoning, right? Why did Jesus do it? He did it because he could. I don't think that's a great answer for what's going on here. And the other traditional scripture lesson goes something like this. Um, the fig tree represents Judaism and the Old Covenant, and the Old Covenant is disappearing like the fig tree, and the New Covenant in, in Jesus is taking its place. So that's the withering away of this other tradition. That's supersessionist, and I don't think we should take that interpretation. That's a bit like la this later Christian tradition saying, our religion's better than yours, na 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 boo boo. I don't think that's what's going on here because newsflash, Jesus was Jewish. So I don't think the point of this is saying that God is doing away with this covenant in Judaism. That's not what's going on here. So if neither one of those two interpretations that Christianity has traditionally given to this passage are right, then what's going on? Well, to understand this, we need to use a tool called literary criticism. Y'all heard of literary criticism? Uh, there, this is in other fields as well, but in biblical studies in particular, what it means is reading the text around it to help determine what it means. So here's what's going on in context. In the first 11 verses before the one we read today, we hear the Palm Sunday story, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And if you've been around here for any length of time at all, you know that I think that was a planned political protest. Jesus on one side, Pontius Pilate on the other, the kingdom of God on one side, the human kingdom, Roman Empire on the other. So those verses immediately precede this one. Then Jesus goes and curses the fig tree. Then, in the portion of the scripture that we cut around today, Jesus goes into the temple and he turns over the money tables and he says, you've made my father's house into a den of robbers. Then he comes back out and he sees the fig tree has been withered away. And then in the verse immediately after that, the chief priest begins to question Jesus' authority and his motives. All of these scriptures are tied together. It's all a part of the Holy Week scripture, the Holy Week story. So to understand this a little more fully, one thing we need to know is that the fig tree was a symbol of peace and security in the ancient world. So if you saw a fig tree, you might think peace, security, like we might think of an olive branch, right? We, we see that and, and we know what it means. So if they saw uh, uh, a fig tree, it was uh, carrying this connotation of peace and security. So that withering away means something. Especially in this age that was supposed to be very peaceful. It was the Pax Romana, after all. But as one of my favorite theologians, Robin Myers, is fond of saying, it was only Pax if you were Romana. Right? It was only peaceful if you were a Roman citizen. If you were a subject of Rome, well, that was a different story. It was a time of prosperity and trade, but for the Jews in Judea, it wasn't a great time because they were under the thumb of the Roman Empire. And they had a king that had been appointed, Herod the Great, and he wasn't so great. Well, that's putting it mildly. He was a horrendous dictator. He made the nation into a police state, and he continued to consolidate wealth and power in the hands of those who were already wealthy and powerful, and he taxed his people almost to death. And you know, you know what he did with those taxes? He built 
monuments, and he tried to make Judea more like Rome. He wanted to make it more worldly. He was not popular. So you had this going on in the political world, and then in the religious world, the same kind of thing was happening. Remember I told you last week that the temple authorities were colluding with Rome so that they could keep their wealth and power? Remember I talked about the Sanhedrin, the, the temple uh, governing board, the judicial board? Well, they were consolidating wealth and power as well. And here's one of the interesting things that happened. People were lending money to, to peasants, and they had the system in the ancient world, the Jubilee year, and every seventh year, the debt would be forgiven. Slaves would be released. Well, the Sanhedrin was ruling in such a way that made those debts non-forgivable. They made them sacred debts. They couldn't be forgiven. So now you had people living in perpetual servitude. Their debts couldn't be forgiven. It's like payday lending today. You get in the cycle, and it's unbreakable. There were these folks living in this kind of world. And as these lenders got more wealth and more power, you know what they did? They began to take over agriculture. And they switched the type of crops that they were using. Instead of subsistence crops, like, say, figs, they switched to cash crops where they could make more money. So now there weren't all that many figs to be found. Figs required a lot of care. You couldn't get a lot of money for them, but they were important to the local economy. Marriages were arranged with figs. Uh, ironically enough, they were one of the first things to be sacrificed at the temple. They were important to life, and now they were hard to find, especially since the elite, especially in Jerusalem, went around, and even though they weren't growing many figs anymore, they still harvested them, and they put them in storehouses, and they created an artificial famine of figs. Isn't this interesting? They knew about supply and demand, and they created an artificial demand, uh, and, and that meant that, that ordinary folks, peasants, had no figs. It meant that passerbys had no figs to eat. Ah, so you see, this takes on new dimensions, doesn't it? Whenever Jesus is cursing the fig tree, he's not just talking about a fig tree. Jesus is cursing the artificial sense of peace that was non-existent. Jesus was cursing this whole social structure that was exploiting his people. Are you noticing a pattern in some of these weird texts in the Bible? They're often covert ways of talking about things that are going on in society. Here, Jesus is making a social commentary. And then we get to that, that part where Peter says, Rabbi, the fig tree has withered away just like you predicted. And Jesus says, yes, have faith, or more accurately translated, God is faithful. And that faith can move mountains. We love that piece, don't we? We love that piece. I don't think Jesus was talking about just any mountains here. Remember, he had just come out of the temple. So I think he was talking about the temple mount. The temple mount. That's what they called the elevated temple. The mountain of the temple. Mount Zion, the Temple Mount. If you have faith, if God is faithful, the mount will be moved because the temple is so corrupt. Remember, he's just gone in and said, this temple is so corrupt. I'm going to overturn these tables. This is what he's talking about here. But he says, it won't always be like this, not in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, there will be plenty of figs and there will be peace. Or another way of saying that is like this. This weekend, we've been building this home in Tijuana. And whenever we got there on Friday, we looked over and some of the folks on the team said, hey, Caleb, there's a fig tree. 
And it was a fig tree that had been larger, and it had been cut down. I don't know why it had been cut down, if it had been rotting, or if it wasn't producing fruit, or if it had just been cut down to make way to build the house. I don't know why it had been cut down. But just on the other side of the fence, a new fig tree had been planted, a young fig tree. And it wasn't producing fruit yet, but it would. A symbol of hope. That's what the kingdom of God is like. It's like the new fig tree planted on the other side of the fence. It's like a new home for a family who's been living without. The kingdom of God is a source of hope that one day things will be just, that one day this world will be at peace, and that things will be better for all. May we hope for that kind of world. May it be so. Amen.